simply who you are. And we 
respond with confidence, knowing that our King is in the boat with us through the storm. You command the seas and the wind. And we have an anchor for our soul, the truth of the gospel. The steadfast love of a King. Father, come help us as we respond with confidence as we sing of your goodness, of your steadfast love. Holy Spirit, come as we respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Sweet, I fight all, fight on my knees with my hands.
But we are going to continue in our study of the book of Acts. Uh, my title today for today's message is Cornelius, a Gentile Pentecost. Ooh, what does he mean by that you're saying? I'll tell you shortly. Cornelius, a Gentile Pentecost. We're going to be looking at Acts 10 today. There's a lot of verses. So are you going to stay with me? We've got a lot of verses to get through today, but before we do that, we do need to pray. Because one of the things God's reminded me as I've been uh, studying this week is the, the power of prayer. And, and I'd forgotten, you know, the power of prayer. So uh, I want us to, to pray now before the Word because we want the Holy Spirit to come and meet with us and speak to us. Otherwise, we're sort of wasting our time, aren't we? So, so let's pray. Let's come before God. Lord, we thank you that we have your Bible. And Lord, more importantly, or as importantly, we thank you that we have your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you sent your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in this world for us to be able to carry out that great commission that you gave to each one of us, Lord. And Lord, I don't want to rush. We've got a lot of verses today, but I don't want to rush prayer, Lord, because I realize that uh, you speak to us through prayer, Lord. You speak to our hearts. Lord, you speak to our lives. And I just ask, Lord, for everybody in this room, Lord, I don't want this word just to be for a few because I, I think you want to speak to all of us, Lord, because we're all part of that great commission. So, Lord, as we go through Acts today and this chapter, I just pray that you would have ears to hear what you would say to us. And we do lift our pastor to you and his wife, Pastor Andy and Kelly. Lord, we thank you that they're taking time out to rest and spend time with you. And we pray even now, Lord, that you would just bless them, Lord. Lift them up, Lord. Just help them to know as they're, as they're having time with each other. But uh, Lord, may they just sense your Holy Spirit there with them, Lord. And speak to them, we pray. So, Lord, we ask you to just continue to be with us now as we open up your Bible, Lord, and as we study. And, Lord, just speak through me today. Lord, we ask these things in your name, and everyone who agrees says? Amen. Amen. Okay, so as you make your way to Acts chapter 10, let's do a very quick recap of how we've got to Acts chapter 10. At this point, we know Jesus has died Jesus has rose again, and now he's ascended to heaven. But in chapter 2 of Acts, we know that Jesus didn't leave us on our own. He promised to send down the Holy Spirit to help us lead our Christian lives. And we saw that in chapter 2 with the followers of Jesus at that time. And we call this time period Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down. And we're still seeing here the church is in, the Christian church is in its infancy. It's still being created. We saw in Acts chapter 6, the apostles, they appoint other spirit-filled believers to assist them in the ministry so that they can continue pre uh, praying and teaching the word. One of these men, you remember, was Stephen. He became the first martyr for the faith. Stoned to death for proclaiming the gospel, being watched by a young, devout Jewish man called Saul. Another helper to the apostles was Philip, who they brought on board to help. He left Jerusalem with others as the persecution came upon the church. He went to Samaria and he preached the word and many believed. He also witnessed to an Ethiopian, e Ethiopian who was converted to Judaism, and he explained the gospel to him as well. And in the last two weeks, we've seen the incredible salvation of Saul, who was on the road to Damascus to arrest and imprison Christians, but we see that great conversion there. And then last week, we see Peter, who's traveling surrounding areas, 
and he's exercising the gifts of the Spirit as well as preaching the gospel. And we left him last week in a place called Joppa on the Mediterranean coast. And so far, we've really seen the Christian church being established with converted Jews. We've also seen Samaria uh, coming to know the Lord, but again, they're a sort of mixed breed, the Samaritans, of Jewish and Gentile, but following sort of Jewish tradition still. So, so far, the church has been pretty much limited to converts of Judaism or this mixed breed of Judaism. But today, we're going to see a definite change in plan, in God's plan, as God extends his grace and salvation to the Gentiles. And that's the reason for my title today, Pentecost Coming to the Gentiles. Is anyone excited about that? No, you're not. Okay. We are Gentiles. We are Gentiles. If we didn't have chapter 10 today, we don't know if we'd be sitting here knowing the grace and the love of God. But because of chapter 10, the Gentiles receive salvation. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you all Jew come, come from Judaism, but... So turn with me. Acts chapter 10. The events surrounding this Roman centurion called Cornelius. So if you're looking at chapter 10, verse 1, say, I'm excited and ready. <laughs> You'll get that. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, a one who feared God with all his household, who would give alms generously to the people and pray to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, this would be about three o'clock in the afternoon to us, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he, the angel, said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up uh, for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius sent for two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So let's stop there for a moment. So we're introduced here to this man whose name is Cornelius. What do we know about Cornelius? We only really know what's given to us in chapter 10 in the Bible, in Acts chapter 10, because he's not mentioned anywhere else. So we see this man Cornelius, we know he's a Roman centurion. What does that mean? A centurion was someone who commanded a hundred Roman soldiers. And because he was from the Italian regiment, we know from history, these were like the uh, dedicated uh, soldiers of the time. These were the committed soldiers of the time. I, you know, what do you call them here? The SEALs, Navy SEALs. These were like the best of the best. So this guy was in charge of a hundred of these soldiers. We know because he was a centurion that he would have been well off. Centurions were well off at that time. He'd said that they earned 16 times more than a general soldier. And we read that he had people waiting on him. So we know, and also he was able to give money away to the poor as well. We'll tell that. So we know he was a fairly wealthy uh, soldier. But being a Roman, uh, we know he was from Italy. We know he was a Roman soldier. He would have grew up worshipping Roman gods, as was the tradition of that day. Gods like Jupiter, Augustus, Mars, Venus. But now we see he's... Uh, sits stationed in this Mediterranean coastal town of Caesarea, which is about northwest of Jerusalem. 
Now this was the headquarters of the Roman governor, so it was an important strategic place for the Roman Empire. Pontius Pilate would live here, he had a palace in Caesarea. And we know from archaeology now that the site was around 230 acres and we know it was fortified with a wall. So 230 acres and the whole thing was fortified with a wall. So this was an impressive structure. We know that there was an amphitheater there that seated thousands. We know that there was a hippodrome there now where they used to race the chariots around. We know there were palaces and temples to the Roman gods. So this wasn't a little place. This was a, a, a major fortress for the Roman, uh, the Roman uh, gods at that time and the Roman people. And here we see this Roman centurion, Cornelius. But look at verse 2. tells us he was a devout man who fears God. He consistently prayed to God and he follows up, not only with words, but with actions by giving to the poor and needy. And I think it's important that we, we don't skip. We can easily skip over these verses but we need to understand there's a, this is a military leader of the most powerful army in the known world at that time. The Romans, we know, were feared, they were hated, they were despised by the Jews. Yet, this, yet God is working in this man's life. Which tells me that there's hope for anyone and everyone. Amen? Cornelius looked out and he looked at the Jewish people and he saw something that appealed to him. He saw this Jewish God. There weren't multiple gods. He saw this Jewish God and he saw the way the Jews lived and the morality that they had. And it caused him to turn away from his heritage of worshipping these Roman gods. He's searching for the meaning of life and he's earnestly praying to God for answers. And like I said, this tells me that there's hope for everyone, you know. There's hope for everyone. And we shouldn't give up praying for the lost and the backsliders. If you have a child or a family member so far away from God that you see that there's no hope for them, if Jesus can save Saul that we've seen recently, if Jesus can save a Roman soldier that we'll see uh, shortly, if Jesus can save you and me, then there's hope for our children, there's hope for our family members, and there's hope for our work colleagues. Amen? Somehow Cornelius had heard about the God of the Jews, and he decided to follow him wholeheartedly. And at this point in verse 2, we don't think Cornelius had a born-again relationship with Jesus. But what we do know is that God was definitely listening and watching Cornelius. How do we know that God was listening and watching? Verse 3 and 4. God sends an angel to him while he's praying, notice. While he's praying, God sends an angel to him. So what does that mean to us? It means that God is watching and listening to what we say and what we do. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? That God is watching and listening to see what we do with our lives. And more than that, we know from previous teachings from Pastor Vandy that we're going to have to give an account for what we did with our Christian life. Yes, our salvation is safe and secure through Jesus Christ, but we still have a, a, a role to play in this earth and we have to account for it. Cornelius was praying and fasting. In verse 30, we'll see that. He was fasting, and God replied by sending an angel, which tells me God responds when we pray earnestly. I want you to write that in your Bibles. Write that in your Bibles. God responds when we pray earnestly. So the converse is, if we don't pray, don't expect God to respond. He'll probably use someone else. But God responds when we pray earnestly. And 
I was convicted this week as I, I was studying this because like sometimes my prayer time, I wake up and it's like 30 seconds of prayer and it's a list of demands. God, can you do this today? Do this today and make sure that happens and uh, you know, bless everyone in the world. Amen. And that's not praying earnestly. And I, I've been convicted this week that you know, if we want to see things happen, things change, God works when we pray earnestly. This Gentile Roman soldier fasted and prayed earnestly to God based on his limited understanding of the faith and God replied. He didn't have this in front of him. He was just hearing from various Jewish, some of them perhaps Christians, about this God, but he didn't have the word like we have. Who thinks that the USA needs revival and coming back to the truth of the Bible. Do we all? Most of us agreed. Not all of us, but most of us. It's only going to come through people earnestly praying. If you look at every revival throughout history, they've only happened because prior to that, there's been people earnestly praying. And if we want to see this country changed, then we have to pray for it. We have to pray for the people. We have to pray for the politicians. We have to pray earnestly. Otherwise, when you look throughout history, when you look at some of these examples we've been looking at over the weeks, God responds through that. So the challenge to you and me today is, you know, we need to increase our prayer life. If you're praying earnestly now, then great. I want you to come up afterwards and I'll be over here and I want you to pray for me to help develop this earnest prayer. But God wants a people who are praying earnestly for him. Are we living in times that need people praying earnestly? Yes. So verse 5 and 6, the angel gives specific instructions to Cornelius about what he was supposed to do. He was to send men to Joppa. Joppa was about 30 miles south on the coast uh, to the house of Simon the Tanner. And he was to go there, they were to go there and ask for Simon Peter, and he will know what to do. Interesting that God sent an angel to connect with Cornelius, uh, to connect Cornelius to Peter. Why didn't the angel just simply tell him, you know, the gospel? The reason is that angels don't understand salvation. They don't understand the saving grace of Jesus that comes through Jesus Christ. The only way people can hear about the gospel and the salvation is through you and me telling them. That's God's plan. That's God's plan is for us to go out and do that great commission. Now, perhaps you're here today and, you know, you've been dragged here to church, you know, week after week. You just get, you know, you're dragged here today and you don't have a a personal relationship. Well, today can be your day of salvation. Amen? Wouldn't it be great today, like Cornelius, we'll see in a few verses, he becomes one with God through the Holy Spirit coming down. And today, if you know in your heart you don't have that personal relationship with God, you've got the head knowledge, you can perhaps recite Bible verses, but you don't have that personal connection, then I would encourage you today to give your life to Jesus and receive that Holy Spirit. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Having your grandfather was a pastor of a church for 50 years doesn't make you a Christian. Someone once said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. I like that. I like that. It's all about a personal relationship with Jesus. Cornelius was still missing this personal relationship with Jesus, but things were about to change. Let's pick up on verse 9. Verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey, they drew near to the city. Peter went up to the housetop to pray, 
It was about the sixth hour, so this is now lunchtime. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. And while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound on all four corners descend into him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again a second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what the vision uh, which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And he called him and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about his vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, Go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by the holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So let's stop here. So now, meanwhile, we saw last week, Peter was in Joppa, staying with Simon the Tanner. In itself, if you remember from last week, Pastor Andy was saying this would have been, Simon the Tanner was someone who would kill animals, skin them, and make them into wineskins and things like that. So because he was dealing with dead animals, uh, he was classified as unclean. And we know from tradition that even Simon the Tanner couldn't just live anywhere. He had to live on the outside of the city because he was classified as unclean. So it's interesting that Peter chooses to stay with someone who's unclean. It's as if God is starting to bring the jigsaw together for him to understand uh, about this people being unclean. But it's lunchtime. Peter's on the flat roof. He's praying. And notice verse 10. Is Peter just hungry? No, he's very hungry. We're not talking apple and celery here. We're talking buffet hungry. You know, this Peter's hungry. He's very hungry, he tells us. And as Peter's praying, God gives him this strange vision. Coming down from heaven was this big sheet with different kinds of four-footed animals, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds. We've even got a picture for you from 2,000 years ago, a selfie that he took. That's not true. That's not true. There was no color in those days. But... So just imagine Peter's on the roof. He's praying. He's very hungry. So his stomach's rumbling. They're preparing the food. And then in this vision, this sheet comes down with all these different animals on. And the voice tells Peter in verse 13, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, to a Jew, this could not be right. It couldn't be the word of God because Peter knew under Levitical law, Leviticus chapter 11, you can read that at your own time, all these animals were considered unclean. But God was preparing Peter for something great that was about to happen. The gospel was about to be extended to the Gentile world. But notice verse 16. It, this is fascinating. to, And I, I can relate to Peter. How many times did God have to tell him again? Three times. Three times the sheep kept coming up and down. The animals must have been getting you know, seasick at this point. You know, spiders falling off the top and whatever. But three times God has to tell Peter again. Because Peter's saying, no, no, it's not. It can't be. It can't be. 
And there was something about the relationship between Peter and God where God had to tell him three times because throughout his experience, uh, God had to tell him three times to do things or things would happen three times. We saw that in Matthew 26. Peter denies Jesus how many times? Three times. In John 21, when Jesus is restoring Peter and asking him, do you love me? How many times does he have to ask him? Three times. And then here in today's verses, God shows Peter three times. Which again is good news for us, isn't it? Because we're not always, you know, right up there with God, are we? God has to tell us sometimes two or three or four times. So, you know, that's okay. We're in standing with Peter. But what's key is that we do it, what God says. We eventually do it. We see here a divine plan where God is working both ends of preparing Cornelius and preparing Peter at the same time. And as with Peter, God may ask us sometimes to do something that makes no sense to us. In all of Peter's heritage, it made no sense what God was telling him, that he would have to deal with something unclean. And sometimes God might ask us to do something, and it doesn't make sense to us, but what's important is that we do it. Amen? Remember, hundreds of years earlier in Joppa, another man was told to go and preach to the Ninevites. And did he do what Peter did? No, he went and ran the other way, Jonah. And that didn't turn out too well for him, did it? So Peter's now in Joppa, and God's going to say to him, go with these men. But this is where prayer comes in. Remember, Peter was praying earnestly. Cornelius was praying earnestly. That's why we have to pray earnestly. Because if someone comes to me and says to me, God's telling me you're to be a missionary in the Ukraine, but he's not mentioned anything to me, I'm going to say, okay, thank you very much, and walk away. You know, if God's asking you to do something and someone comes to you, he's going to put it on your heart as well. You might not like it, but he's going to be on your heart already because we're seeing here a pattern. We saw it last week with uh, Ananias and Saul. God spoke to both of them, so when they came together, it wasn't a surprise. We're seeing it here, Peter and Cornelius. God's speaking to both of them, and it's not a surprise to Peter that he has to go with them because God's already prepared them. So let's learn from this, that God, if he's telling you to do something major, I'm not saying, you know, which restaurant should we go to afterwards or where do I fill gas up, QT or somewhere else. You know, I'm talking about major decisions. God is going to put it on your heart and he's going to confirm it. There's a biblical principle we've seen over these past weeks. So let's remember that. Let's remember that. But to be used, Peter had to overcome his prejudices. And we all have prejudices in our life, but they shouldn't get in the way of sharing God's word. Write that in your neighbor's Bible. We all have prejudices, but they shouldn't get in the way of sharing God's word. Amen? My son, he goes to uh, USC in Columbia. So obviously, I'm a Gamecocks supporter. But some of you in here may support an inferior football team <laughs> called, called the Clemson Tigers. Now, I'm not going to hold a grudge against you for that because you don't understand or you don't follow the truth and you follow an inferior team, but I'm not going to hold a grudge against that. We have to over... Oh, look, Ashley's even walking out. She's offended. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ashley, I didn't know you were Clemson Tigers, but I won't use this in the second service, promise. Well, I might, I might. But more seriously, though, more seriously, do we stay away from people? No one's going to go to the restroom in second service, though, are they? <laughs> because they know they're going to be single, though. But anyway, do you stay away and avoid someone at work because of their race, because of their religion, because of their appearance. Perhaps God has put you in that situation, perhaps even with a neighbor, because we're the ones he wants us to witness to that person. We need to pray and ask God if he wants us to go out and witness to those people. 
To the Jew, the Gentiles were unclean, and they should have no association with them whatsoever. In fact, one commentator said uh, it was common for Jewish men at that time to begin their day in prayer by thanking God that they were not a slave, that they were not a Gentile, and then finally that they weren't a woman. Women don't. I'm just quoting here. I'm just quoting here. Yeah, they would pray in the day, thank you God I'm not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. And you can take that up with... uh, with William Barclay who quoted that. So God is about to change something in Peter's life by telling him he needs to go with these gentle Gentiles. And as a backup, we see there that Peter takes with him some of the guys. He's not going to go and do this himself. He wants some backup here. And we know from Acts 11 uh, that he takes six men with him. So just think what this two-day walk is. They're going 30 miles north. So you've got, you got the Roman soldier. You've got two of Cornelius' servants. You've got six Jewish guys and Peter. And they're walking 30 miles, probably a day, day and a half, up to uh, meet Cornelius. That would have been an interesting discussion, don't you think? Have you ever thought? I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us what they talked about. But uh, it would have been interesting, wouldn't it, to see a, a tape of that? You know, did they just... Because Peter, you know, he was still trying to work out what God was trying to do here. The six Jews probably thought, what on earth is Peter doing here? And then you've got this Roman and two, uh, you know, two servants. Well, anyway, I'm digressing there. So what happens when they get there? Look at verse 24. Verse 24. Are you still with me? We've got a big section now, so let's go for it. So the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. He was ready to party. You get that sense with Cornelius? He's he's excited. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him. He fell down at his feet and he worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go uh, to, to one of another nation? But God, notice this, isn't that, you know, without those two words, but God was changing something here in history. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Three times it took God to get him there, but he got there. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until the hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your arms have been remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately and you have done well to come now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God then Peter opened his mouth and said in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality interesting God shows no partiality but In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit uh, and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those uh, who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, 
whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Crucifixion, crucifixion, which by the way, the Romans invented. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before uh, by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, through the name of Jesus, whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, say it with me, whoever believes in him will receive remission, forgiveness of sins. Now, Peter's on a roll now, isn't he? He's got his five-point sermon plan, you know, and he's, he's into it now. He's on like point, you know, point one. I've told you who Jesus is, you know, I've got another four points to bring up. But look at verse 44. This is great. While Peter was still speaking, you know, he hasn't finished yet, but while Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, talking about the six Jewish believers who came with Peter, they were astonished at many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter said, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Okay, a lot of verses there. Some of them were repeated from earlier verses in the chapter. So I'm going to pick some of the highlights here. So think of the scene. We're in this major city, Roman fortified city. We've got this high-profile Roman centurion, Cornelius. He's waiting uh, for the arrival of this Jewish fisherman, Peter. He's got now his friends and family. You know, they're all in here as well. We don't know how many, but I'm guessing there was quite a few. You know, he brought all those in here as well. And verse 25, Peter arrives and Cornelius falls on his knees and he worships Peter. But Peter quickly corrects Cornelius. He tells him uh, that God did speak to him to come. Even though the Jewish law tells him he shouldn't be doing this, he did it because God told him. And we're reading in these verses not only the conversion of this Gentile Cornelius and his household, but we're also seeing here a conversion of thinking for Peter, that Jesus died for all, not just the Jews. And Pastor Randy spoke about this last week. It's like a sort of miracle unfolding in front of our eyes. Gentiles are now being witnessed to by Jewish Christians, and they're getting saved. And we're here today as Gentiles because Peter overcame these prejudices and listened to God. Because Jesus died for all humanity. Amen? It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, whether you're young or old, whether you're a Muslim or an atheist. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of a company or the one who mops the floor. Jesus died for all. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Jesus died for all. My name is Peter Wilcox, and I approve of this message. <laughs> Sorry, I've been watching too much. Sorry, I've been watching too much TV. But I approve of this message. Does anyone else approve of this message? If only, if only they argued about points in the Bible and how we should live. Wouldn't that be an amazing testimony? That's why we have to pray earnestly. So as a born again believer here today, are we willing to share the gospel with everybody? 
I think the message that God is telling me today is that we can't limit ourselves to our own thinking. God's plan is for all to hear the word, and it's our job to go and do that, whether it's at home, whether it's with our neighbors, whether it's at work. And we can't let people, if they've got a sign in the yard, stop us from telling them about the truth of Jesus. Amen? Verse 34, we see Peter, fisherman by uh, trade, unschooled. He's got no degree in divinity, yet he's leading a prominent Roman Gentile soldier and his household to salvation in Jesus Christ. We can use Pastor Randy as a modern-day example of this. He's not been to seminary. He's not obtained a degree in divinity or theology. Yet God has called him here to tell people about Jesus Christ. Amen? So it doesn't matter who you are today. God wants to use you. And I don't think God's going to get the word out there because his plan is to use us. His plan is to use us. You see it through, throughout history of the Bible that God wants to use Christians to tell people about him. And it's our job to do that. In Peter's short sermon, he made sure out of his five points he got the first point across before the Holy Spirit came. But in that short sermon, he explained the person of Jesus and whoever believes in Jesus can have their sins forgiven. But praise God for verse 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and the household. And salvation was followed by the gift of speaking in tongues. And notice what were they doing as they were speaking in tongues? They were glorifying God. The gift of tongues should always glorify God. So this is truly a milestone in church life. And thus my title today, Cornelius, the Gentile Pentecost. Later in Acts, Peter would have to, will have to explain what happened when he goes to Jerusalem. Because the Jewish believers at that time, they, they thought even if Gentiles became Christians, then they would still have to follow Jewish traditions. So when he gets to Jerusalem, they don't understand this concept that a Gentile can become a Christian but not follow the Jewish customs. And Peter had to explain it, as we'll see in coming weeks. And aren't you glad that we don't have to follow Jewish customs, men? You know what that would have mean if we'd have had to follow Jewish customs? No bacon. I love my bacon sandwich. But we don't have to follow Jewish customs. We have to follow the Holy Spirit. But that's another point for us. Another point for us. As we witness, as we lead people to Christ, we have to be careful. We have our own traditions that we perhaps don't even know. But we have to be careful. Our own traditions, we don't try forcing them onto other people. You know, you can't wear a Clemson's Tiger shirt in church. It's, you know, it's not allowed. But it is allowed. It is allowed. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you about not wearing it. That's, but anyway, <laughs> let, let God do the speaking. We, we just lead them to Christ, and the Holy Spirit does all the work. Peter allowed the Holy Spirit to interrupt his sermon. I'm open to that as well. The Holy Spirit was doing work in the hearts of those listening, and Peter went with the flow. He stopped and called for water baptism. And as we pray and witness to others, let's be aware of what the Holy Spirit wants to do to lead and guide us. Let's take time and not rush. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. Peter was obedient to God. He overcame his Jewish Jewish tradition and prejudices to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Cornelius was a good man who feared God, yet he needed a personal relationship with Jesus. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you today to reach out to someone? Perhaps you've had someone on your mind, on your heart for weeks 
and you don't really want to go and talk to them, you don't want to communicate for whatever reason, perhaps you've been rejected, but it's the Holy Spirit saying, one more time, just go and do it one more time. Write a letter to them one more time. Just tell them Jesus loves them, or however the Holy Spirit uses you. Jesus died for all, and we are his witnesses now to go out and tell people about his wonderful grace and love for them. Amen? So as the musicians come back and we sing a final song, let's use this last song just to pray to God and say, God, how do you want to use me? Is there anything in my life that's causing me division to not want to go and talk to someone? Just lift that to God today and ask him to take that away. Perhaps you've come here and you've got this head knowledge of God, but you haven't got that personal relationship with God. If you want that today, salvation, to know that Jesus is in your life and Jesus can help you with your life, then ask. Ask. All you have to do is recognize that Jesus came and died for you. Ask for forgiveness and he will come into your life. Mm -hmm.